Chapter 2 One arm's host bled from countless wounds. An endless campaign, successive defeats followed by even costlier victories. But of all the wounds borne by the army of Dujek One Arm, those to its soul were the gravest. Silver Fox, Outrider Herlikel. Nestled amidst the rocks and tumbled boulders of the hillside, Corporal Picker watched the old man make his laborious way up the trail. His shadow slipped over Blend's position, yet the man who cast it knew nothing of the soldier's proximity. Blend rose in silence behind him, dust sloughing down, and made a series of hand gestures intended for Picker. The old man continued on unawares. When he was but a half dozen paces away, Picker straightened, the grey cloak left by the morning's dust storm cascading away as she levelled her crossbow. Far enough, traveller, she growled. His surprise sent the old man stumbling back a step. A stone turned underfoot and he pitched to the ground, crying out yet managing to twist to avoid landing atop the leather pack strapped to his back. He skidded another pace down the trail and found himself almost at Blen's feet. Picker smiled, stepped forward. That'll do, she said. You don't look dangerous, old fella, but just in case... There's five other crossbows trained on you right now. So, how about you tell me what in Hood's name you're doing here? Sweat and dust stained the old man's threadbare tunic. His sunburned forehead was broad over a narrow set of features, vanishing into an almost chinless jaw. His snaggled, crooked teeth jutted out in all directions, making his smile an argumentative parody. He pulled his thin, leather-wrapped legs under himself and slowly levered upright. A thousand apologies, he gasped, glancing over a shoulder at Blend. He flinched at what he saw in her eyes, swung hastily back to face Picker. I thought this trail untenanted, even by thieves. You see, my life savings are invested in what I carry. I could not afford a guard, nor even a mule. You're a trader, then, Picker drawled. Bound where? Pale. I am from Darutistan. That's obvious enough, Picker snapped. Thing is, Pale is now in Imperial hands, as are these hills. I did not know about these hills, that is. Of course, I am aware that Pale has entered the Malazan embrace. Picker grinned at Blend. Hear that? An embrace. That's a good one, old man. A motherly hug, right? What's in the sack, then? I am an artisan, the old man said, ducking his head. Um, a carver of small trinkets. Bone, ivory, jade, serpentine. Anything invested? Spells and the like? The corporal asked. Anything blessed? Only by my talents, to answer your first query. I am no mage, and I work alone. I was fortunate, however, in acquiring a priest's blessings on a set of three ivory talks. What god? Treach, the tiger of summer. Picker sneered. That's not a god, you fool. Treach is a first hero, a demigod, a soul-taken ascendant. A new temple has been sanctified in his name, the old man interrupted, on the street of the hairless ape in the Gadrobi quarter. I, myself, was hired to punch the leather binding for the book of prayers and rituals. Picker rolled her eyes and lowered the crossbow. All right, let's see these talks then. With an eager nod, the old man unslung his pack and set it down before him. He released the lone strap. Remember, Picker grunted, if you pull anything awry, you'll get a dozen quarrels airing your skull. This is a pack, not my breeches, the trader murmured. Besides, I thought it was five. The corporal scowled. Our audience, Blen said quietly, has grown. That's right, Pick added hastily. Two whole squads, hiding, watching your every move. With exaggerated caution, the old man drew forth a small packet of twine-wrapped doeskin. The ivory is said to be ancient, he said in a reverent tone, from a third tusked monster that was once Treach's favorite prey. The beast's corpse was found in frozen mud in distant Ellingarth. Never mind all that, Picker snapped. Let's see the damn things. The trader's white, wiry eyebrows rose in alarm. Damned? No, not ever. You think I would sell cursed items? Be quiet. It was just a damned expression. Hurry up. We haven't got all damn day. Blend made a sound, quickly silenced by a glare from her corporal. The old man unwrapped the packet, revealing three upper arm rings, each of one piece and undecorated, polished to a gleaming pale luster. Where's the blessing marks? None. They were each in turn wrapped within a cloth woven from Treach's own Maltair. For nine days and ten nights. Blen snorted. Maltair? The corporal's face twisted. What a disgusting thought. Spindle wouldn't think so, Blend murmured. A set of three arm talks, Pick amused. Right arm, left arm, then where? And watch your mouth with delicate flowers, Blend and me. All for one arm. They are solid, yet they interlock. Such was the instruction of the blessing. Interlocking yet seamless. This I have to see. I cannot, alas, demonstrate this sorcery, for it will occur but once, when the purchaser has threaded them onto his or her weapon arm. Now that has Swindle written all over it. Well, we got him right here, Blen said. Cheats only work if you could make a clean getaway, like in Pale's crowded markets. Well, indeed. Picker grins down at the old man. We're not in a crowded market, are we? How much? The trader squirmed. You have selected my most valued work. I intended an auction for these. How much, old man? Three hundred gold councils. Councils? 
That's Darugistan's new coinage, isn't it? Pale's adopted the Malazan Jakarta, a standard weight, Blend said. What's the exchange? Damned if I know, Picker muttered. If you please, the trader ventured. The exchange in Darugistan is two and one-third Jakartas to one council. Broker's fees comprise at least one Jakarta. Thus, strictly speaking, one and a third. Blen shifted her weight, leaned forward for a closer look at the talks. Three hundred councils would keep a family comfortable for a couple of years at least. Such was my goal, the old man said. Although, as I live alone and modestly, I anticipated four or more years, including materials for my craft. Anything less than three hundred councils, and I would be ruined. My heart weeps, Picker said. She glanced over at Blend. Who'll miss it? The soldier shrugged. Rustle up three columns, then. At once, Corporal. Blend stepped past the old man, moved silently up the trail, then out of sight. I beg you, the trader whined. Do not pay me into Carters. Calm down, Picker said. Opon's smiling on you today. Now step away from the pack. I'm obliged to search it. Bowing, the old man backed up. The rest is of lesser value, I admit. Indeed, somewhat rushed. I'm not looking to buy anything else, Picker said, rummaging with one hand through the pack. This is official now. Ah, I see. Are some trade items now forbidden in pale? Counterfeit Jakarta's for one. Local economy's taking a beating. And the Rujistan councils aren't much welcome either. We've had quite a haul this past week. The trader's eyes widened. You will pay me in counterfeited coin? Tempting, but no. Like I said, Opon's winked your way. Finished with her search, Picker stepped back and pulled out a small wax tablet from her belt pouch. I need to record your name, trader. It's mostly smugglers using these trails, trying to avoid the post of the plane's track through the divide. You're one of the few honest ones, it seems. Those clever smugglers end up paying for their cleverness tenfold on these here trails, when the truth is, they'd have a better chance slipping through the chaos at the post. I am named Moonlug. Picker glanced up. You poor bastard. Blend returned down the trail, three wrapped columns of coins cradled in her arms. The trader shrugged sheepishly, his eyes on the wrapped coin stacks. Those are councils. Aye, Picker muttered, in hundred columns. You'll probably throw your back lugging them to pale, not to mention back again. In fact... You needn't bother making the trip at all now, right? She fixed him with her eyes as she put the tablet back into the pouch. You have a valid point, Moonag conceded, rewrapping the talks and passing the packet to Blend. I shall journey to Pale nonetheless, to deal the rest of my work. Eyes shifting nervously, he bared his crooked teeth in a weak smile. If Opon's luck holds, I might well double my take. Picker studied the man a moment longer, then shook her head. Greed never pays, Moonag. I'd lay a wager that in a month's time, you'll come wending back down this trail with nothing but dust in your pockets. What say you? Ten castles? If I lose, you'd have me ten in debt to you. Ah, oh, well, I'd consider a trinket or three instead. You've skilled hands, old man, no question of that. Thank you, but I respectfully decline the wager. Picker shrugged. Too bad. You've another bell of daylight. There's a wayside camp up near the summit. If you're determined enough, you might reach it before sunset. I shall make the endeavor. He slung his arms through the pack's straps, grunted upright, then, with a hesitant nod, moved past the corporal. Hold on there. Baker commanded. Moonag's knees seemed to weaken, and the old man almost collapsed. Yes, he managed. Picker took the talks from Blend. I've got to put these on first. Interlocking, you claimed, but seamless. Oh, yes, of course. By all means, proceed. The corporal rolled back the sleeve of her dusty shirt, revealing in the heavy wall's underside its burgundy dye. Moonag's gasp was audible. Picker smiled. That's right, we're bridge burners. Amazing what dust disguises, hey? She worked the ivory rings up her scarred, muscled arm. Between her biceps and shoulder, there was a soft click. Frowning, Picker studied the three talks, then hissed in surprise. I'll be damned. Munag's smile broadened for the briefest of moments, then he bowed slightly. May I now resume my journey? Go on, she replied, barely paying him any further attention, her eyes studying the gleaming talks on her arm. Blen stared after the man for a full minute, a faint frown wrinkling her dusty brow. Munag found the side cut in the path a short while later. Glancing back down the trail to confirm for at least the tenth time that he was not followed, he quickly slipped between the two tilting stones that framed the hidden entrance. The gloomy passage ended after a half-dozen paces, opening out onto a track winding through a high-walled fissure. Shadow swallowed the trader as he scurried down it. Sunset was less than a hundred heartbeats away, he judged. The delay with the bridge burners could prove fatal if he failed to make the appointment. After all, he whispered, gods are not known for forgiving leeches. The coins were heavy. His heart thumped hard in his chest. He wasn't used to such strenuous efforts. He was an artisan, after all. Down on his luck of late, perhaps, weakened by the tumours between his legs, no doubt. But his talent and vision had, if anything, grown sharper for all the grief and pain he had suffered. I have chosen you for those very flaws, Munag. That and your skills, of course. Oh, yes. I have great need of your skills.
A guard's blessing would surely take care of those tumours. And if not, then three hundred councils would come close to paying for a Danul healer's treatment back in Daruchistan. After all, it wasn't wise to trust solely in a god's payment for services. Munag's tale to the bridge burners about an auction in Pale was true enough. It paid to fashion options to map out fallback plans. And while sculpting and carving were his lesser skills, he was not so modest as to deny the high quality of his work. Of course, they were as nothing compared to his painting. As nothing. Nothing. At all. He hastened along the track, ignoring the preternatural mists that closed in around him. Ten paces later, as he passed through the Warren's Gate, the clefts and crags of the East Tallinn Hills disappeared entirely, the mists thinning to reveal a featureless stony plain beneath a sickly sky. Further out on the plain sat a ragged hide tent, smoke hanging over it in a sea-blue haze. Munag hurried towards it. Chest laboring, the artisan crouched down before the entrance and scratched on the flap covering it. A ragged cough sounded from within, then a voice rasped, Enter, mortal. Munag crawled in. Thick, acrid smoke assaulted his eyes, nostrils, and throat, but after his first breath, a cool numbness spread out from his lungs. Keeping his head lowered and eyes averted, Munag stopped just within the entrance and waited. You are late, the god said, wheezing with each breath. Soldiers on the trail, master. Did they discover it? The artisan smiled down at the dirty rushes of the tent floor. No, they searched my pack, as I knew they would, but not my person. The god coughed again, and Munag heard a scrape as the brazier was drawn across the floor. Seeds popped on its coals, and the smoke thickened. Show me. The artisan reached into the folds of his threadbare tunic and drew forth a thick, book-sized package. He unwrapped it to reveal a stack of wooden cards. Head still lowered and working blind, Munag pushed the cards towards the god, splaying them out as he did so. He heard the god's breath catch, then a soft rustle. When it spoke again, the voice was closer. Floors? Aye, master. One for each card, as you instructed. Ah, this pleases me. Mortal, your skill is unsurpassed. Truly, these are images of pain and imperfection. They are tortured, fraught with anguish. They assault the eye and bleed the heart. More, I see chronic loneliness in such faces as you have fashioned within the scenes. Dry amusement entered its tone. You have painted your own soul, mortal. I have known little happiness, must. The god hissed, nor should you expect it. Not in this life, not in the thousand others you are doomed to endure before you attain salvation, assuming you have suffered enough to have earned it. I beg that there be no release in my suffering, master, Munich mumbled. Lies. You dream of comfort and contentment. You carry the goal that you believe will achieve it, and you mean to prostitute your talent to achieve yet more. Do not deny this, mortal. I know your soul. I see its avidness and yearning here in these images. Fear not. Such emotions amuse me, for they are the paths to despair. Yes, master. Now, Munuk of Daruchistan, your payment. The old man screamed as fire blossomed within the tumors between his legs. Twisting with agony, he curled up tight on the filthy rushes. The guard laughed, the horrible sound breaking into lung-ravaging coughs that were long in passing. The pain, Munuk realized after a while, was fading. You are healed, mortal. You are granted more years of your miserable life. Alas, as perfection is anathema to me, so it must be among my cherished children. But ma master, I cannot feel my legs. They are dead, I am afraid. Such was the price of curing. It seems, artisan, that you will have a long, wearying crawl to wherever it is you seek to go. Bear in mind, child, that the value lies in the journey, not in the goal achieved. The god laughed again, triggering yet another fit of coughing. Knowing he was dismissed, Munich pulled himself around, dragged the dead weight of his lower limbs through the tent entrance, then lay gasping. The pain he now felt came from his own soul. He pulled his pack up alongside him, rested his head on it. The columns of stacked coins were hard against his sweat runnel forehead. My rewards, he whispered. Blessed is the touch of the fallen one. Lead me, dear master, down the paths of despair, for I deserve this world's pain in unending bounty. From the tent behind him, the crippled god's laughter hacked the air. Cherish this moment, dear Munarch. By your hand, the new game is begun. By your hand, the world shall tremble. Munarch closed his eyes. My rewards. Blend continued staring up the trail, long after the trader had disappeared from view. He was not, she muttered, as he seemed. None of them are, Picker agreed, tugging at the torques on her arm. These things are damn tight. Your arm will probably rot and fall off, Corporal. She looked up with wide eyes. You think they're cursed? Blend shrugged. If it was me, I'd have quick Ben take a good long peer at them, and sooner, not later. Dog's balls, if you had a suspicion, 
Didn't say I did, Corporal. It was you complaining they were tight. Can you get them off? She scowled. No, damn you. Oh. Blend looked away. Picker contemplating giving the woman a good, hard cuff. But it was a thought she entertained at least ten times a day since they'd paired up for this posting. And once again, she resisted it. Three hundred councils to buy my arm falling off. Wonderful. Think positive, Corporal. It'll give you something to talk about with Dujek. I really do hate you, Blend. She offered Picker a bland smile. So, did you drop a pebble in that old man's pack then? Aye, he was fidgety enough to warrant it. He damn near fainted when I called him back, didn't he? Blend nodded. So, Picker said, unrolling her sleeve. Quick Ben tracks him, unless he cleans out his pack. The corporal grunted. He cared less about what was in it than I did. No, whatever serious booty he carried was under his shirt, no doubt about it. Anyway, he'll be sure to put out the word when he gets to bail. The traffic of smugglers through these hills will drop right off, mark my words, and I'll lay coin on that wager. And I threw in the line about better chances at the divide when you was off collecting the councils. Blen's smile broadened. Chaos at the crossroads, eh? The only chaos parents crew has over there is what to do with all the takings. Let's fix some food. The Maranth will likely be as punctual as usual. The two bridge burners made their way back up the trail. An hour after sunset, the flight of Black Maranth arrived, descending on their quarrels in a slithering flutter of wings to the circle of lanterns Picker and Blend had set out. One of them carried a passenger who clambered off as soon as his quarrels' six legs alighted on the stony ground. Picker grinned at the cursing man. Over here, quick! He spun to face her. What in Hood's name have you been up to, Corporal? Her grin fell away. Not much, wizard. Why? The thin, dusk-skinned man glanced over a shoulder at the Black Maranth, then hastened to the position where Picker and Blend waited. He lowered his voice. We need to keep things simple, damn it. Coming over the hills, I almost fell out of that knobbly saddle. This warren swirling around down here, power bleeding from everywhere. He stopped, stepped closer, eyes glittering. From you too, Picker. Cursed, after all, Blend muttered. Picker glared at her companion and threw as much sarcasm into her tone as she could muster. Just like you suspected all along, right, Blend? You lying, you've acquired the blessing of an ascendant, Quick Ben accused in a hiss. You idiot! Which one, Picker? She struggled to swallow with a suddenly dry throat. Uh, Treach? Oh, that's just great! The corporal scowled. What's wrong with Treach? Perfect for a soldier. The tiger of summer, the lord of battle. Five centuries ago, maybe! Treach veered into his soul-taken form hundreds of years ago. The beast hasn't had a human thought since. It's not just mindless, it's insane, Picker! Blen snickered. The wizard whirled on her. What are you laughing at? Uh, nothing. Sorry. Picker rolled up her sleeve to reveal the talks. It's these, Quick Ben, she explained hastily. Can you get them off me? He recoiled upon seeing the ivory bands, then shook his head. If it was a sane, reasonable ascendant, maybe some negotiation might be possible. In any case, never mind. Never mind? Picker reached out and gripped handfuls of rain cape. She shook the wizard. Never mind? You sniveling worm! She stopped suddenly, eyes widening. Quick Ben regarded her with a raised eyebrow. What are you doing, Corporal? He asked softly. Ah, uh, sorry, wizard. She released him. Sighing, Quick Ben adjusted his cape. Blend, lead the Marantz to the cash. Sure, she said, ambling towards the waiting warriors. Who made the delivery, Corporal? The talks? Forget the talks, you're stuck with them. The council's from Dirujistan, who delivered them? Odd thing, that, Baker said, shrugging. A huge carriage showed up, as if from nowhere. One moment the trail's empty, the next there's six stamping horses in the carriage. Wizard, this trail up here can't manage a two-wheeled cart, much less a carriage. The guards were armed to the teeth too and jumpy. I suppose that makes sense, since they were carrying ten thousand councils. Tregala, Quick Ben muttered. Those people make me nervous. After a moment he shook his head. Now, my last question. The last tracker you sent off, where is it? Picker frowned. Don't you know? Uh, they're your pebbles, wizard. Who did you give it to? A carver of trinkets. Trinkets like the one you're wearing on your arm, Corporal. Well, yes, but that was his lone prize. I looked at all the rest, and it was good, but nothing special. Quick Ben glanced over to where the black armoured Maranth were loading wrapped columns of coin onto their quarrels under Blend's smirking gaze. Well, I don't think it's gone far. I guess I'll just have to go and find it. Shouldn't take long. She watched him walk off a short distance, then sit cross-legged on the ground. The night air was growing cold, a west wind arriving from the Tallinn Mountains. The span of stars overhead had become sharp and crisp. Picker turned and watched the loading. Blend, she called. Make sure there's two spare saddles besides the wizards. Of course, she replied. The city of Pale wasn't much, but at least the nights were warm. Picker was getting too old to be camping out night after night, sleeping on cold, hard ground. The past week waiting for the delivery had settled a dull ache into her bones. At least, with Darujistan's generous contribution, Dujek would be able to complete the army's resupply. With Opon's luck, they'd be on the march within a week. Off to another hood-kissed war, as if we ain't weary enough. Fainous hoof. Who or what is the Panyan Domin anyway? Since leaving Darujistan eight weeks past, 
Quick Ben had been attached to second in command Whiskey Jack staff, with the task of assisting in the consolidation of Dujek's rebel army. Bureaucracy and minor sorceries seemed strangely well suited to one another. The wizard had been busy weaving a network of communications through Pale and its outlying approaches. Tithes and tariffs, in answer to the army's financial needs and the imposition of control, easing the transition from occupation to possession. At least for the moment, Quick Ben thought. One arm's host and the Malazan Empire had parted ways, after all, yet the wizard had wondered more than once at the curiously imperial responsibilities he had been tasked to complete. Outlaws, are we? Indeed. And hood dreams of sheep gambling in green pastures, too. Dujek was waiting. Caladan Brood's army had taken his time coming south, and had only the day before reached the plain north of Pale. Tista Andy at its heart, with mercenaries and Ilgres Bargast on one flank, and their rivi and their massive Bedouin herds on the other. But there would be no war. Not this time. No, by the abyss, we've all decided to fight a new enemy, assuming the parley goes smoothly. And given that the Rudistan's rulers are already negotiating with us, that seems likely. A new enemy. Some theocratic empire devouring city after city in a seemingly unstoppable wave of fanatic ferocity. The Panion Domin. Why do I have a bad feeling about this? Never mind. It's time to find my wayward tracker. Eyes closing, Quick Ben loosed his soul's chains and slipped away from his body. For the moment, he could sense nothing of the innocuous water-worn pebble he had dipped into his particular host of sorceries. So he had little choice but to fashion his search into an outward spiral, trusting in proximity to brush his senses sooner or later. It meant proceeding blind, and if there was one thing the wizard hated, Ah, found you. Surprisingly close, as if he'd crossed some kind of hidden barrier. His vision showed him nothing but darkness. Not a single star visible overhead, but beneath him the ground had leveled out. I'm into a warren, all right. What's alarming is, I don't quite recognize it. Familiar, but wrong. He discerned a faint reddish glow ahead, rising from the ground. It coincided with the location of his tracker. The smell of sweet smoke was in the tepid air. Quick Ben's unease deepened, but he approached the glow nonetheless. The red light bled from a ragged tent, he now saw. A hide flap covered the entrance, but it hung untied. The wizard sensed nothing of what lay within. He reached the tent, crouched down, then hesitated. Curiosity is my greatest curse, he thought. But simple acknowledgement of a flaw does not correct it. Alas. He drew the flap aside and looked inside. A blanket-wrapped figure sat huddled against the tent's far wall, less than three paces away, leaning over a brazier from which smoke rose in sinuous coils. Its breathing was loud, labored. A hand that appeared to have had every one of its bones broken, lifted into view and gestured. A voice rasped from beneath the hooded blanket. Enter, mage. I believe I have something of yours. Quick Ben accessed his warrants. He could only manage seven at any one time, though he possessed more. Power rippled through him in waves. He did so with reluctance. To unveil simultaneously nearly all he possessed filled him with a delicious whisper of omnipotence. Yet he knew that sensation for the dangerous, potentially fatal illusion it was. You realize now, the figure continued between wheezing gasps, that you must retrieve it. For one such as myself to hold such a link to your admirable powers, mortal. Who are you? The wizard asked. Broken, shattered, chained to this fevered corpse beneath us. I did not ask for such a fate. I was not always a thing of pain. Quick Ben pressed a hand to the earth outside the tent, quested with his powers. After a long moment, his eyes widened, then slowly closed. You have infected her. In this realm, the figure said, I am as a cancer. And with each passing of light, I grow yet more virulent. She cannot awaken whilst I burgeon in her flesh. He shifted slightly, and from beneath the folds of filthy blanket came the rustle of heavy chain. Your gods have bound me, mortal, and think the task complete. You wish a service in exchange for my tracker, Quick Ben said. Indeed. If I must suffer, then so too must the gods and their world. The wizard unleashed his host of warrens. Power ripped through the tent. The figure shrieked, jerking backward. The blanket burst into flame, as did the creature's long, tangled hair. Quick Ben darted into the tent behind the last wave of his sorcery. One hand flashed out, angled down at the wrist, palm up. His fingertips jabbed into the figure's eye sockets, his palm slamming into its forehead, snapping the head back. Quick Ben's other hand reached out and unerringly scooped up the pebble as it rolled amidst the rushes. The power of the Warrens winked out. Even as the wizard pulled back, pivoted and dived for the entrance, the chained creature bellowed with rage. Quick Ben scrambled to his feet and ran. The wave struck him from behind, sent him sprawling onto the hot, steaming ground. Screaming, the wizard writhed beneath a sorcerous onslaught. He tried to pull himself further away, but the power was too great. It began dragging him back. He clawed at the ground, stared at the furrows his fingers gouged in the earth, saw the dark blood welling from them. Oh, burn! Forgive me! The invisible, implacable grip pulled him closer to the tent entrance. Hunger and rage radiated from the figure within, as well as the certainty that such desires were moments from deliverance. Quick Ben was helpless. 
You will know such pain, the guard roared. Something reached up through the earth then. A massive hand closed about the wizard, like a giant child snatching at a doll. Quickman screamed again as it pulled him down into the churning, steaming soil. His mouth filled with bitter earth. A bellow of fury echoed dimly from above. Jagged rocks ripped along the wizard's body as he was pulled further down through the flesh of the sleeping goddess. Starved of air, darkness slowly closed around his mind. Then he was coughing, spitting up mouthfuls of gritty mud. Warm, sweet air filled his lungs. He clawed dirt from his eyes, rolled onto his side. Echoing groans buffeted him, the flat, hard ground beneath him slowly buckling and shifting. Quickben rose to his hands and knees. Blood dripped from his soul's torn flesh. His clothes were naught but strips. But he was alive. He looked up and almost cried out. A vaguely human-shaped figure towered over him, easily fifteen times the wizard's own height, its bulk nearly reaching the cavern's domed ceiling. Dark flesh of clay, studded with rough diamonds, gleamed and glittered as the apparition shifted slightly. It seemed to be ignoring Quickben, though the wizard knew that it had been this beast that had saved him from the crippled god. Its arms were raised to the ceiling directly above it, hands disappearing into the murky, red-stained roof. Vast arcs of dull white gleamed in that ceiling, evenly spaced like an endless succession of ribs. The hands appeared to be gripping, or possibly were fused to two such ribs. Just visible beyond the creature, perhaps a thousand paces down the cavern's length, squatted another such apparition, its arms upraised as well. Twisting, Quickben's gaze traveled the opposite length of the cavern. More servants, the wizard saw four, possibly five of them, each one reaching up to the ceiling. The cavern was, in fact, a vast tunnel, curving in the distance. I am indeed within Burn, Quickben thought. The sleeping goddess, a living warren, flesh and bone, and these servants. You have my gratitude, he called up to the creature looming above him. A flattened, misshapen head tilted down. Diamond eyes stared like descending stars. Help us. The voice was childlike, filled with despair. Quickben gaped. Help? She weakens, the creature moaned. Mother weakens. We die. Help us. How? Help us, please. I, I don't know how. Help. Quickben staggered upright. The clay flesh he now saw was melting, running in wet streams down the giant's thick arms. Chunks of diamond fell away. The crippled gods killing them, poisoning Burn's flesh, he thought. The wizard's thoughts raced. Servant, child of Burn, how much time until it is too late? Not long, the creature replied. It nears, the moment nears. Panic gripped quick Ben. How close? Can you be more specific? I need to know what I can work with, friend. Please try. Very soon. Tens, tens of years, no more. The moment nears. Help us. The wizard sighed. For such powers, it seemed, centuries were as but days. Even so, the enormity of the servant's plea threatened to overwhelm him, as did the threat. What would happen if Byrne dies? Peru friend, I don't think I want to find out. All right, then. It's my war now. He glanced down at the mud-strewn ground around him, questing with his senses. He quickly found the tracker. Servant, I will leave something here so that I may find you again. I will find help, I promise, and I will come back to you. Not me, the giant said. I die. Another will come. Perhaps. The creature's arms had thinned, were now almost devoid of their diamond armor. I die now. It began to sag. The red stain in the ceiling had spread to the ribs it held, and cracks had begun to show. I will find an answer, Quick Ben whispered. I swear it. He gestured, and a warren opened. Without a last glance, lest the vision break his heart, he stepped within and was gone. A hand shook his shoulder incessantly. Quick Ben opened his eyes. Damn you, mage, Picker hissed. It's almost dawn. We have to fly. Groaning, the wizard unfolded his legs, wincing with every move, then let the corporal help him upright. Did you get it back? She demanded, as she half carried him to the waiting quarrel. Get what back? That pebble? No. We're in trouble, Picker. We're always in trouble. No, I mean all of us. He dug in his heels, stared at her. All of us. Whatever she saw in his expression left her shaken. All right, but right now we've got to get moving. Aye, you better strap me in. I won't be able to stay awake. They came to the quarrel. The man seated in the forward kite in the saddle swung its helmed head to regard them in silence. Queen of dreams, Picker muttered as she wrapped the leather harness around Quick Ben's limbs. I ain't never seen you this scared, wizard. You got me ready to piss ice cubes. They were the last words of the night that Quick Ben remembered, but remember them he did. Ganaway's paran was plagued by images of drowning, but not in water, drowning in darkness. Disorientated, thrashing in panic in an unknown and unknowable place. Whenever he closed his eyes, vertigo seized him, knots tightening in his gut, and it was as if he'd been stripped down to a child once again. Terrified, uncomprehending, his soul twisting with pain. The captain left the barricade at the Divide, where the day's last traders were still struggling through the press of Malazan guards, soldiers and clerics. 
He'd done as Dujek had commanded, setting up his encampment across the throat of the pass. Taxation and wagon searches had yielded a substantial haul, although, as the news spread, the takings were diminishing. It was a fine balance, keeping the tax at a level that the merchants could stomach, and allowing enough contraband through, lest the chokehold turn to strangulation, and travel between Darugistan and Pale dried up entirely. Paran was managing, but just barely. Yet it was the least of his difficulties. Since the debacle of Darugistan, the captain had been feeling adrift, tossed this way and that by the chaotic transformation of Dujek and his renegade army. The Malatan's anchor had been cut away. Support structures had collapsed. The burden upon the officer corps had grown overwhelming. Almost 10,000 soldiers had suddenly acquired an almost childlike need for reassurance. And reassurance was something Paran was unable to give. If anything, the turmoil within him had deepened. Threads of bestial blood coursed his veins. Fragmented memories, few of them his own, and strange unearthly visions plagued his nights. Daylight hours passed in a confused haze. Endless problems of material and logistics to deal with, the turgid needs of management pushed again and again through the rising flood of physical maladies now besetting him. He'd been feeling ill for weeks, and Paran had his suspicions as to the source. The blood of the Hound of Shadow, he thought. A creature that plunged into Dark's own realm. Yet can I be sure of this? The emotions frothing this crest, more like a child's. A child's. He pushed the thought away once more, knowing full well it would soon return, even as the pain in his stomach flared once again. And, with another glance up to where Trotz held sentinel position, continued making his way up the hillside. The pain of illness had changed him. He could see that within himself, conjured as an image, a scene both peculiar and poignant. He felt as if his own soul had been reduced into something piteous, a bedraggled, sweat-smeared rat, trapped within a rockfall, twisting and squirming through cracks in a desperate search for a place where the pressure, the vast, shifting weight, relented. A space in which to breathe, he thought. And the pain all around me, those sharp stones, are settling, still settling, the spaces between them vanishing. Darkness rising like water. Whatever triumphs had been achieved in Darugistan now seemed trivial to Paran. Saving a city, saving the lives of Whiskey Jack and his squad, the shattering of Lassine's plans, they had one and all crumbled into ash in the captain's mind. He was not as he had been, and this new shaping was not to his liking. Pain darkened the world. Pain dislocated. Turned one's own flesh and bones into a stranger's house, from which no escape seemed possible. Bestial blood, he thought. It whispers of freedom, whispers of a way out but not from the darkness. No. Into that darkness, where the hounds went, deep into the heart of Anamanda Rake's cursed sword, the secret heart of Dragnipur. He almost cursed aloud at that thought, as he worked his way along the hillside trail, overlooking the divide. Day's light was fading. The wind combing the grasses had begun to fall away, the rasping voice retreating to a murmur. The blood's whisper was but one of many, each demanding his attention, each offering contradictory invitations. Desperate paths of escape. But always escape, he thought. Flight. This cowering creature can think of nothing else, even as the burdens settle, and settle. Dislocation. All I see around me, he thought, feels like someone else's memories. Grass woven on low hills, outcrops of bedrock, studding summits. And when the sun sets and the wind cools, the sweat on my face dries, and darkness comes. And I drink its air as if it was the sweetest water. Gods, what does that mean? The confusion within him would not settle. I escaped the world of that sword, he thought. Yet I feel its chains about me, nonetheless, drawing ever tighter. And within that tension, there was an expectation. Of surrender. Of yielding. An expectation to become. What? Become what? The Bargar sat amidst high, tawny grasses on a summit overlooking the divide. The day's flow of traders had begun to ebb on both sides of the barricade, the clouds of dust fading over the rutted road. Others were setting up camps. The throat of the pass was turning into an unofficial wayside. If the situation remained as it was, the wayside would take root, become a hamlet, then a village. But it won't happen, he thought. We're too restless for that. Dujek's mapped out our immediate future, shrouded in the dust of an army on the march. Even worse, there are creases in that map, and it's starting to look like the bridge burners are about to fall into one. A deep one. Breathless and fighting yet more twinges, Captain Parron moved to crouch down beside the half-naked, tattooed warrior. You've been strutting like a bull bedouin since this morning, Trotz, he said. What have you and Whiskey Jack brewed up, soldier? The Bargar's thin, wide mouth twisted into something like a smile, his dark eyes remaining fixed on the scene down in the valley. The cold darkness ends, he growled. To hood it does. The sun's moments from setting, you grease-smeared fool. Cold and frozen, Trotz continued, blind to the world. I am the tale, and the tale has been unspoken for too long, but no longer. I am a sword about to leave its scabbard. I am iron, and in the day's light, I shall blind you all. Ah! Aaron spat into the grasses. Mallet mentioned your sudden loquaciousness. He also mentioned that it hasn't done anyone else any good. Since with its arrival, you've lost what little sense you showed before then. 
The bargar thumped his chest, the sound reverberating like a drumbeat. I am the tale, and soon it shall be told. You will see, Malazan. You all will. The sun's withered your brain trots. Well, we're heading back to Pale tonight, though I'd imagine Whiskey Jack's already told you that. Here comes Hedge to relieve you as lookout. Aaron straightened, disguising the wince that came with the movement. I'll just finish my rounds then. He trudged off. Damn you, Whiskey Jack. What have you and Duchek cooked up? Baron thought. The Panion Domin. Why are we sparing a mole's ass for some upstart zealots? These things burn out, every time. They implode. The scroll scribblers take over, they always do, and start arguing obscure details of the faith. Sex form, civil war erupts, and there it is, just one more dead flower trampled on history's endless road. Aye, it's also bright and flush right now. Only colors fade, they always do. One day, the Malazan Empire will come face to face with its own mortality. One day, dusk will fall on the Empire. He bent over as yet another knot of burning pain seized his stomach. No, think not of the Empire. Think not of Lassine's cull. Trust in Devorah. You know his baron. Your sister will salvage the house. Better than you might have managed. Far better. Trust in your sister. The pain eased slightly. Drawing a deep breath, the captain resumed making his way down to the crossing. Drowning, he thought. By the abyss, I am drowning. Clambering like a rock ape, Hedge reached the summit. His bandy legs carried him to the Bargar's side. As he passed behind Trods, he reached out and gave the warrior's single knotted braid a sharp tug. Ha! he said, moving to settle down beside the warrior. I love the way your eyes bug out when I do that. You, Sapper, the Bargar said, are the stump beneath a pebble in a stream running through a field of sickly pigs. Good one, though a tad long-winded. Got the captain's head spinning, have you? Trots said nothing, his gaze now on the distant Tallinn mountains. Hedge pulled his scorched leather cap from his head, scratched vigorously through the few remaining wisps of hair on his pate, studied his companion for a long moment. Not bad, he judged. Noble and mysterious. I'm impressed. You should be. Such poses are not easy to hold, you know. You're unnatural. So why are you twisting Paran around? Trotz grinned, revealing a blue-stained row of filed teeth. It is fun. Besides, it's up to Whiskey Jack to explain things. Only he ain't done any explaining yet. Dujek wants us back in pale, gathering up what's left of the bridge burners. Paran should be happy he's getting a company to command again, instead of just a couple of beat-up squads. Did Whiskey Jack say anything about the upcoming parley with Brood? Trot slowly nodded. Hedge scowled. Well, what? It is coming up. Oh, thanks for that. By the way, you're officially relieved of this post, soldier. They're cooking up a bedroom carcass for you down there. I had the cook stuff it with dung, since that's how you like it. Trots rose. One day, I may cook and eat you, Sapper. And choke to death on my lucky bone? The Bargas frowned. My offer was true, Hedge. To honour you, my friend. The sapper squinted up at Trotz, then grinned. Bastard, you almost had me there. Sniffing, Trotz turned away. Almost, he said. Ha ha. Whiskey Jack was waiting when Parham returned to the trader post and its makeshift barricade. Once the sergeant, now Dujek one arm second in command, the grizzled veteran had come in with the last flight of Maranth. He stood with his old squad's healer, Mallet, the two of them watching a score of soldiers from the second army, loading the past week's toll onto the quals. Parham approached, walking cautiously so as to hide the pain within him. How fares the leg, commander? he asked. Whiskey Jack shrugged. We were just discussing that, Mallet said, his round face flushed. It's healed badly. Needs serious attention. Later, the bearded commander growled. Captain Parron, have the squads assembled in two bells. Have you decided what to do with what's left of the ninth? Aye, they'll join what's left of Sergeant Ansi's squad. Whiskey Jack frowned. Give me some names. Ansi's got Corporal Picker and, let's see, um, Spindle, Blend, Detorin. So with Mallet here and Hedge, Trots and Quickben, Quickben and Spindle are now Cardra mages, Captain. But you'll have them with your company in any case. Otherwise, I guess Ansi will be happy enough. Mallet snorted. Happy? Ansi don't know the meaning of the word. Parent's eyes narrowed. I take it then that the bridge burners won't be marching with the rest of the host. No, you won't be. We'll go into that back at Pale, though. Whiskey Jack's flat grey eyes studied the captain for a moment, then slid away. There's thirty-eight bridge burners left. Not much of a company. If you prefer, Captain, you can decline the position. There's a few companies of elite marines short on officers, and they're used to noble-borns commanding them. There was silence. Parran turned away. Dusk was coming, the valley shadow rising up the slopes of the surrounding hillsides, a spatter of dim stars emerging from the sky's dome. I might take a knife in the back, is what he's telling me, Parran thought. Bridge burners have an abiding dislike for noble-born officers. A year ago, he would have spoken those words out loud, in the belief that bearing ugly truths was a good thing to do. The misguided notion that it was the soldier's way, he thought when in fact it's the opposite that is a soldier's way. In a world full of pitfalls and sinkholes, you dance the edges. Only fools jump feet first, and fools don't live long besides. He had felt knives enter his body once, wounds that should have been fatal. 
The memory sheathed him in sweat. The threat was not something he could simply shrug off in a display of youthful, ignorant bravado. He knew that, and the two men facing him knew it as well. I still, Parent said, eyes on the darkness devouring the south road, would consider it an honor to command the bridge burner, sir. Perhaps in time, I might have the opportunity to prove myself worthy of such soldiers. Whiskey Jack grunted. As you like, Captain. The offer remains open if you change your mind. Parent faced him. The commander grinned. For a little while longer, anyway. A huge, dark-skinned figure emerged from the gloom, her weapons and armor softly clinking. Seeing both Whiskey Jack and Parran, the woman hesitated. Then, fixing her gaze on the commander, she said, The watch is being turned over, sir. We're all coming in, as ordered. Why are you telling me, soldier? Whiskey Jack rumbled. You talk to your immediate superior. The woman scowled, pivoted to face Parran. The watch? I heard it, Tarn. Have the bridge burners get their gear and assemble in the compound. It's still a bell and a half before we leave. I'm aware of that, soldier. Yes, sir. At once, sir. The woman ambled off. Whiskey Jack sighed. About that offer. My tutor was Napan, Parent said. I've yet to meet a Napan who knows the meaning of respect, and Detoran's no exception. I'm also aware, he continued, that she's no exception as far as bridge burners go either. It seems your tutor taught you well, Whiskey Jack muttered. Parent frowned. What do you mean? His disrespect for authorities rubbed off, Captain. You just interrupted your commander. Ah, oh, my apologies. I keep forgetting you're not a sergeant anymore. So do I, which is why I need people like you to get it right. The veteran turned to Mallet. Remember what I said, Hela? Aye, sir. Whiskey Jack glanced once more at Parran. To hurry up and wait was a good touch, Captain. Soldiers love to stew. Parran watched the man head off towards the gatehouse, then said to Mallet, Your private discussion with the commander, Hela. Anything I should know? Mallet's blink was sleepy. No, sir. Very well. You may rejoin your squad. Yes, sir. When he was alone, Parran sighed. Thirty-eight bitter, resentful veterans, already twice betrayed, he thought. I wasn't part of the treachery of the Siege of Pale, and the scene's proclamation of outlawry embraced me as much as it did them. Neither event can be laid at my feet, yet they're doing it anyway. He rubbed at his eyes. Sleep had become an unwelcome thing. Night after night, ever since their flight from Darugistan. Pain and dreams, no, nightmares. Gods below. He spent the dark hours twisted beneath his blankets, his blood racing through him, acid bubbling in his stomach. And when consciousness finally slipped from him, his sleep was fitful, racked with dreams of running. Running on all fours, he thought, then drowning. It's the blood of the hound, coursing undiminished within me. It must be. He tried to tell himself more than once that the shadow hound's blood was also the source of his paranoia. The thought elicited a sour grin. Untrue, he thought. What I fear is all too real. Worse, this vast sense of loss, without the ability to trust anyone. Without that, what do I see in the life awaiting me? Naught but solitude, and thus nothing of value. Now all these voices... Whispering of escape. Escape! He shook himself, spat to clear the sour phlegm in his throat. Think of that other thing, that other scene. Solitary, baffling. Remember, Parran, the voice you heard. It was Tattersales. You did not doubt it then. Why do so now? She lives. Somehow, some way, the sorceress lives. Ow! A pain! A child screaming in darkness. A hound howling lost in sorrow. A soul nailed to the heart of a wound. And I think myself alone. Gods, I wish I were! Whiskey Jack entered the gatehouse, closed the door behind him, and strode over to the scribe's table. He leaned against it, stretched out his aching leg. His sigh was like the easing of endless knots, and when it was done, he was trembling. After a moment, the door opened. Straightening, Whiskey Jack scowled at Mallet. I thought your captain had called for an assembly, Healer. Parents in worse shape than even you, sir. We've covered this. Guard the lads back. You having second thoughts, Mallet? You misunderstand. I just quested in his direction. My Denor Warren recoiled, Commander. Whiskey Jack only now noted the pallid cast of the healer's round face. Recoiled? Aye, that's never happened before. The captain's sick. Tumors? Cancers? Be specific, damn it! Nothing like that, sir. Not yet, but they'll come. He's eaten a hole in his own gut. All that he's holding in, I guess. But there's more. We need Cook Ben. Parron's got sorceries running through him like fireweed roots. Open! No, the twin jesters are long gone. Parron's journey to Derugistan. Something happened to him on the way. No, not something. Lots of things. Anyway, he's fighting those sorceries, and that's what's killing him. I could be wrong in that, sir. We need Quick Ben. I hear you. Get him on it when we get to Pale. But make sure he's subtle. No point in adding to the captain's unease. Mallet's frown deepened. Sir, it's just... Is he in any shape to take command of the bridge burners? You're asking me? If you want to talk to Duchek about your concerns, that's your prerogative, Healer. If you think Parran's unfit for duty, do you, Mallet? 
After a long moment, the man sighed. Hmm, not yet, I suppose. He's as stubborn as you are, sir. Hood, you sure you two aren't related? Damn sure, Whiskey Jack growled. Your average camp dog has purer blood than what's in my family line. Let it rest for now, then. Talk to Quick and Spindle. See what you can find out about those hidden sorceries. If gods are plucking parent strings again, I want to know who, and then we can mull on why. Mallet's eyes thinned as he studied the commander. Sir, what are we heading into? I'm not sure, Hela. Whiskey Jack emitted with a grimace. Grunting, he shifted weight off his bad leg. With Opon's luck, I won't have to pull a sword. Commanders usually don't, do they? If you gave me the time, sir. Later, Mallet. Right now I've got a parley to think about. Brood and his armies arrived outside, pale. Aye. And your captain's probably wondering where in Hood's name you've disappeared to. Get out of here, Mallet. I'll see you again after the parley. Yes, sir.